My name is Bond. James Bond. James Bond. So does England. Where is Agent Triple X? This is Triple X. Message received and understood. Watch out! He was in Vanguard three weeks ago. Did you kill him? The answer to the question is yes. I did kill him. Then, when this mission is over, I will kill you. Drinks Dom Perignon 52 can't be all bad. A British nuclear submarine goes missing by mysterious ways, and British secret agent James Bond 007 gets called in, but gets an unwelcome reception, which has fatal consequences. And the beautiful Soviet agent Triple X is also put on the case and is made aware that her lover has been killed. James Bond gets his briefing, which leads him to follow a contact in Egypt. Bond follows a lead to Cairo, where he gets another unwelcome reception, and heads to the pyramids to meet a contact named Fekish, but who is cut down by the giant assassin known as Jaws. Bond continues on to search for Max Calva at the Majava Club, where he runs in once again to Agent Triple X. The two engage Max Calva in a bidding war for a certain microfilm, but Calva meets a similar fate at the hands of Jaws. James Bond and Triple X follow the assassin into the desert for a head-on confrontation with Jaws and barely escape with the important microfilm. Triple X gives James Bond the slip, but they meet again for a briefing of their two countries, and the two are assigned to join forces. As they journey by train to their next stop, it's another unwelcome intrusion. James Bond saves the day, and the two join forces, you know, that way too. Arriving in Italy, James Bond receives a gift from Q. After being received from the lovely Naomi, they are taken to the magnificent Atlantis base, and Bond comes face to face with Carl Stromberg. After returning to shore, James Bond and Triple X come head to head with a few adversaries, but shake off their enemies through a waterborne escape. During a quiet moment, it's revealed that James Bond was the one who murdered Triple X's lover, and she vows at the conclusion of the mission that she will murder James Bond. The two allies board an American submarine, which is soon hijacked by the massive Lipperous tanker, and the crew is taken hostage. Stromberg reveals his sinister plan to fire two nuclear bombs, triggering World War III. The crew is to remain in captivity, but Agent Triple X is taken with Stromberg back to his Atlantis base. James Bond breaks free of his captors and frees the crew of the submarine, who fight back against their captors. After a lengthy battle, James Bond and the crew reprogram the submarines to fire on each other. The crew return to the sub and escape the tanker just in time, but James Bond returns to the Atlantis to rescue Agent Triple X. James Bond confronts Stromberg and takes him out, and after one last grapple with Jaws, James Bond rescues Triple X, and the two escape the Atlantis base before it's sunk. And after one last conflict, all is forgiven, and the two sail off into the sunset. Written by Christopher Wood and Richard Maybaum, directed by Lewis Gilbert, 1975 Seven. Sevens, The Spy Who Loved Me. Just imagine, 1977, you'd go see The Spy Who Loved Me and the original Star Wars. Pretty cool. And, oh, this is true. And Smokey and the Bandit, too. Pretty this cool. Very true. <laughs> I don't know how I forgot that, too, because there's a track called Bond 77. So should, yes, th yeah. Th yeah. That should have rolled off my tongue, but it didn't. But Yeah, speaking of the soundtrack, that is, this is one of the few soundtracks where uh, we haven't really gotten any expansion. I'd love to see an expanded Spy Love Me soundtrack. Mm. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. the, the soundtrack as it is, it's sort of like more of a lounge version of what the soundtrack is, kind of, sort of. It's good, it's fine, but mm -hmm. I'd like to see an expansion. Oh, and So this... I'm sorry. Yeah. In, in honor, in honor of uh, you know, Anya Amasova, she orders, uh, but she likes Bacardi on the rocks. But I went a little more complicated. I went with a Moscow Mule tonight. So we're oh, just, uh, very yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, very nice. I'm actually is, finishing off a uh, bottle of white wine. So oh, far. Yeah, very if nice. This, if this uh, if this video is a little weird, uh, that could be part <laughs> yeah, of it. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but nice touch. But nice touch with the Moscow Mule for yeah, our Russian it's, uh, agent. It's uh, vodka, ginger beer, and a little lime juice. Very okay. good. Very refreshing. Nicely yeah. done, my friend. Yeah, oh, thank you. 
So the spy will love me. Let's get into it. Yes. Uh, what do you think? Give me an give me an overview, Scott. Well, <laughs> I think uh, this is one of the most important films in the James Bond series. Uh, Man with the Golden Gun was not well received. Um, Harry Saltzman show, uh, sold his interest in the Bond series to the United Artist. So um, Albert R. Broccoli is something of a gambler, and uh, he took a gamble here. He said, "Let's go in. Let's go all in." Let's just do it. If we're going to go out, let's go out with a bang. And uh, he made, I think, a terrific movie. This movie's back history is kind of interesting, too, because originally Guy Hamilton was slated to direct this, but he decided to go off and he was going to do Superman the movie, which we all know was eventually directed by Richard Donner. Oh, right, right, right. So, um, and uh, they had a few passes at the screenplay. The, the original screenplay had Spectre involved. Um, but then, you know, Kevin McClory came out where, you know, he was going to do, uh, at that time he was going to do a movie called Warhead. Um, and he, a, any kind of, uh, mention of Spectre or any of that was not allowed. So they decided to scrap that idea. And then Richard Maybaum wrote a treatment where it was more about this terrorist organization. Hmm. And, uh, Broccoli thought that was too political. So, um, they got, uh, eventually it's Maybaum and Christopher Wood came and they developed what we have now. Which is a pretty terrific James Bond film, I think. Uh, yes, I would agree. Um, we're in the Roger Moores, and we're still sort of... I find that the tone of this film, they kind of do hit sort of a sweet spot. Where it's not as kind of goofy and out there as some of the ones before. On some levels, it's <laughs> possibly even more so. <laughs> yeah. Yet in other ways, it's actually a little grounded. Like when I show when they when they're on the sub and they're having very serious conversations and there's sort of a like a military tone about it. Mm -hmm. They they kind of manage to straddle the fence interestingly. You know, on one hand they keep it grounded. On one hand, it's 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 very over the top and borderline cartoonish. But it's working. It is absolutely working. And one of my favorite things about this film is that Roger Moore's James Bond is they're starting to embrace uh, some of the classic Bond elements again, which they've been yes. avoiding in the last two. No more cigars, no more bourbon. You know, we're back to martinis. Uh, and, and there's even a mention of Bond's wife, that the fact that he'd been married once before. Yes. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was, it was starting to look like this incarnation of Bond could have been sort of an unspoken reboot, but they kind of said, "No, no, no! This is James Bond. We're gonna do it the Bond way," and 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 it really pays off. It does, and uh, the movie gets off to a terrific start with that uh, great yep. ski jump, which is amazing. Yes, uh, Rick Sylvester did that jump, and he got paid thirty thousand dollars for his trouble. I think he got underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great and and the thing is too they had a couple helicopters to get that shot and uh, they didn't get it you know and luckily there was one guy on the cliff over there he got that shot that we all see now in the film you know with mm. the, and the perfectly way the british flag opens on the parachute and everything terrific yes. terrific oh my god yeah. that and that is that is a tremendous shot when you watch that yes. i mean it's easy now to sort of take take it for granted absolutely but wow is that good i mean when you think about how long he's falling yes you know it's almost like when you watch the background you think any second now he's he's gonna have to pull the cord because yeah. the ground has to be coming very quickly not at all i mean he i mean you know when he at least he gets rid of the skis that's the thing and yeah. he, he has to sort of balance himself for a while before he can actually pull the cord he needs to straighten himself out first yes so it, it lingers a long time. It does. And I'll tell you that, and this is an interesting thing too, the, the complaints that I've had are just that maybe the observations, not so much complaints, but live and let die, the man with the golden gun. I, I remember saying when we were talking that there were very low stakes movies. No big, huge stunts, no big over the top spectacle, you know, that this movie sort of responds yes. to that. Oh, absolutely. And says, oh, no, 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 no. We are going to throw in some full-blown spectacle. Oh, big time. And I think this this ski jump is, bam. They're just like, here you go, right out of the gate. Here's here's a lot. Here's a big old hunk of spectacle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's spectacular. You know? And, you know, nowadays, you know, with the CGI and everything, those things kind of get killed. Even, like, as great sure. as, like, say, Mission Impossible Fallout was or something. You know, there's some trickery mm. going on. Here, it's just, you know, it's an analog world. So it is what it is, yep. pretty much. Yep. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, is, it is really tremendous. And then as the, the story gets going, oh, by the way, as long as we're kind of around the beginning of the film... 
I remember saying a while back when we talked about the music of James Bond. Yes. And I said that the theme song was just okay. And you were like, what do you, what? <laughs> what do you mean just okay? Right. And I kind of had sort of a, uh, I, I guess, a, a, a crisis of conscience. <laughs> I started listening to it and I went, yeah. I was, wow, this is good. This is a, such a good oh, song. Oh, it's great. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I remember kind of writing it off as being like a product of its time. And, yeah, it was fine for the 70s, whatever. But it is a great song. And, and honestly, I feel like I listen to it now and I just say, they don't make them like they used to. It's like this love ballad to James Bond. It's pretty terrific. Yeah. Yes. Big time. Yes. It's a total love letter, James Bond. When you listen to the lyrics of it. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And I'm, re- I'm re- kind, kind of in this. Kind of in the same way, I think like the original Goldfinger kind of was, and then later the Golden Eye was sort of a yes, kind of a love letter yeah. to James Bond. Yeah. And this one mm-hmm. really is just pu- a pure love letter to James Bond. It's oh, for so sure. so good. And Maurice Binder's, uh, I think I don't know if it's, the titles here are really cool. You know, he did he did mm. a terrific job this time. Yeah, it seems like everybody was kind of. I guess maybe there was like a little bit of a old hat. A little bit in some of the other effort, you know, from Diamonds on to like through GoldenEye, there's a uh, GoldenEye, mm. the Golden Gun. So I think there's a little bit more of like everybody some like kind of getting recharged and bringing their A game back. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely too. And you and you did tell some of the, you you told the backstory about uh, Cubby Broccoli. Yeah. Now he's swinging for the fences. Now he wants a Grand Slam, and this is it. You yeah. see it in this. Again, they, they, they're they they're playing the cards very close to the vest in the last two films. And, yeah, I mean, again, I mean, going all the way back, frankly, to Diamonds, really, you know, very low stakes kind of films. Not, no, if there is a big budget, I, you're not seeing it on screen. Uh, but here they decide we're getting back into blockbuster territory. We're, we're, we are taking this back over and, and we are going to do blockbuster films. David, I mean, and, Broccoli went as far as to like, like build a set. I mean, literally that Pinewood Studios that, that I think it's now the 007 mm. soundstage. Um, yes. he did built it for this movie mm-hmm. and it's, it's, and, and yeah. you got Ken Adam in there. It, it's, it's, you know, you got some terrific sets. I mean, we'll get into that, but I mean, the, the set design is phenomenal in this too. Let's talk about the cast, I guess. Yeah, um, this has got a pretty uh, Barbara Bach as Anya Anamasa. I mean, she's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I'd say I'd say maybe her acting ability. It, it, it's she's fine, you know, but uh, she's not like in uh, like say Honor Blackman or uh, some of the other uh, great or, or uh, Diana Rigg. She's not in that class, yeah. but uh, she does a fine mm. job here, I think. Yes, you can you can tell they're going a little more for looks than for acting ability, which is fine. Yeah. They're, if you have to err on one side versus the other, yeah, I mean she is she is absolutely stunning to look at. Uh, yeah, I agree that the the accent is kind of kind of breaks up a little bit, and some of the performances are a tiny bit wooden. Uh, but you know she's good, she's terrific, she's a classic. Yeah, I mean, there's that one scene where uh, she discovers that Bond probably killed her uh, boyfriend there. Yes, and that's a that's a really good scene. I, I don't think it's it's up to the level of say like some you know some of the stuff that later would happen with um, mm. with uh, Daniel Craig and Eva Green and those great scenes in Casino Royale, but uh, it's a pretty darn good scene. Yes, it is, and honestly, I kind of felt like I when I was rewatching it today. I, I did. I had a moment where I was like, man, I forgot how good this was yeah. and how Roger Moore nails and this screenplay nails the character of James Bond. Yes. Like when she says that to him, like, did you kill him? Any, no, any, I think any one of us would have been like, what, 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 uh, humming, humming, humming. Yeah. but you know, he is just, he's so cool. He pauses, he collects himself, and he explains it, and then he says, "Yes, yeah." I he's did. like, "The answer to the question is yes, I did kill him." And he doesn't make any like any fuzzy or it's this gray in there. <laughs> he's just like, "Hey," he's it, like, he, "Yeah, I did it, man." Yeah, I, right. And he doesn't. He does. He literally does not apologize. You know, he just says, "It is what it is." You know as well as I do that this is what happened, and that's that. If you don't like it, tough nuggies. Right. 
There's uh, some great. This you know so, as far as as much as uh, Moore gets uh, pounded a little bit about being too clownish and mm. too fun, you know, with the quips and everything. There's some badass moments in this. Um, I'm thinking particularly of uh, that fight with Shandor on the rooftop there, and then he, you know, he's hanging yeah, by yeah, his yeah. you know Bond's tie, <laughs> and he, you know, totally. he tells him where you know pyramids, and then he just. <laughs> That's uh-huh. a great Bond moment if ever there was one, you know. What a helpful chap. What a helpful chap. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. totally. He really does have good moments. And by the way, even after the, the scene where he says, yes, I killed him, it's interesting how, like, the next scene where they're together and they're being hoisted up yeah. into the helicopter. Yeah. And he just kind of has his, like, smirk on. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's almost kind of, like, classic, yeah. like, badass. Like, again, I don't apologize to him, but I'll tease you until you sort of, like, change your mood right. a little bit. Uh, and it... You know, and it really works. It's it, it. By the time they get to the end, he has played his played it correctly. You know, I mean, yeah. I think this is like you know we've talked about like in you only have twice how this is similar, um, and and, and story construction. Mm, yes, and yes. that is true. But I think this that whole wrinkle of that 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 B plot about her and like Bonnet killed her boyfriend and everything that makes it um, things much more interesting. I think. I think it actually helps the story as a whole. It, it does, and it makes it much more complex it does. because, uh, like I remember, like again, watch rewatching it again. I sort of, I I was I I remember noticing that, you know, the romance between Bond and Anya now because of what's going to happen later, happens at a different pace, yeah. as opposed to like a typical Bond film where. You know, there's some sexual tension and then some things happen. And then by the end, they're kind of making out and going off into the sunset. Here, they're actually, they, they're consummating. They're becoming a couple much earlier so that once you sort of hit the, you know, two-thirds markers around, that's when the reveal happens that he killed the guy and then the whole dynamic changes. Yeah, that's right. It's like here it's not too quick and it's not it's not too late, you know? We're, we're, we're the, because yes. like, I think we talked about like in License to Kill, I was like those. I mean, I, I like that movie a lot more than you do. But the um, the Carrie Lowell character, it just it seems like kind of a little all, all over the yes. place. I mean, the, 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 and mm-hmm. it's because like you know the Bond structure or formula demands it, and that's where they get into trouble sometimes. Yeah, right. And in that film, it doesn't um, it doesn't add anything to the story as, no, least as far as I can tell. Yeah. But in this one. Right, but in this case, it, it does. does absolutely the, does the, the, accelerating things a little more because you want to get to that next wrinkle yes. where this happens, and now you've got a problem. Yes, you know it that this complicates the absolutely. whole thing. Absolutely. So yeah, I I really do. I I really like it. I really think it's it's great in that respect. Yeah, and I also think this is a good travelogue. This movie, you know, it's it, I love the locations mm. on this. Really great. Yes, very nice locations, beautiful locations. I, I yeah. completely agree with that. And, uh, you know, there's just something about um, the way this film is edited that I really like. Um, oh, we're gonna, we should actually talk about Jaws here a bit. The, when Jaws is introducing <laughs> this, he's a fearsome uh, force to be reckoned with, you know? Um, and mm. I love the way they introduced him. Because um, he's, he's he's very um, nearly terrifying in, in the, the first couple scenes, yeah. you know? Then when he once he drops that rock on his foot, though, man, they there's no going back, you know. <laughs> Is that the first inkling of the uh, coyote yes, and the roadrunner? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I you know I we should probably add you know I I've never met him but I've heard nothing. We we talked about last in uh, Live and Let Die. We talked about how Roger Moore was a guy that just no one ever had yes. a bad thing, a bad word about. Richard Keel was always the same way. That I anything I've ever yeah. heard about him is just wonderful. He's a, he's the nicest nicest guy. And if you were a Bond fan and you ever met him, it was it was such right, a rich right. rewarding experience. Oh, that's great. Um, I, I have I have friends now in the Bond community that have, have remained friends with his family okay. long after his passing oh, for that reason. Oh, that's great. You know, I mean, it's he's a really that's great terrific. guy. And yeah, I, I tell you, honestly, I kind of feel like 
I mean, when you watch him in the film, like when he first walks out and he walks up and he's towering over the other guy and you're kind of going like, wow, he's big. I feel like you don't really even get it fully until the train sequence when he comes yeah. out. When he, I mean, like Barbara Bach then looks then like I'll, a doll next to him. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Roger Moore looks like Roger Moore looks like a Ken doll next to him. I mean, he's, yeah, he's I know. oh my God. Like you really, I don't even think you even get the whole picture until yeah. you, you see them together and you're like holy and, cow. and i think jaws is really he's great kill is great they're all um in those like first few scenes are particularly great you know like in, in the pyramids and i love the way they mm. have the uh the music the that's playing on outside but it's also playing into it sort of matches the action with bond and everybody else yes that's great stuff it's, and I, totally. I, I don't know if that was marvin hamlish's idea or not oh we should say that yeah this is um the second uh, film not to be scored. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's probably the third film that hasn't been scored by John Barry um, fully. Uh, so Marvin Hamlish took the mm. reins, and uh, I think I think to me it's a little bit of a mixed bag. I mean, there's some excellent cues. Like there's the tanker, um, which is a great cue. Uh, you know, on the album, it's a little more of a lounge version of the tanker, but in the film, it's very orchestra- orchestral and it's it's just grand mm-hmm. and great. Um, yeah, but he did something. He really most of the time. I'd say most of the time he hits it out of the park with his score. Yeah, I I agree. I agree, and and it's funny. It's always when John Barry is missing from a film, you sort of immediately go to all right. How is this guy holding up compared to it's John true. Barry? So they always get that kind of unfair comparison. But yeah, I would say he he does hold up, and it's. I, again, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but yes, the fact that this film is now sort of starting to move into a different era, and and again, it, and it, we've we've talked in a few of these before about how once in a while you sort of feel a step forward in time. Yes, mm-hmm. I I think this is sort of another one where you're starting to really notice that the, the we, we have moved forward. We are in yeah. a different era. Uh, one of the things I noticed, I mean, again, the, the score is great and it really does match with the time yeah. frame and it, it accelerates this film. Uh, another thing I think that adds to what, what I'm sort of saying is this, the special effects are actually pretty yes. good. Yeah. Like we're, we're starting to get into a world where the special effects are kind of like, I, I wouldn't totally compare them to today, but I, I think they're kind of getting to where it feels kind of comparable I mean, to today like like I, I like i i i would watch this like if i'm watching dr no and we're talking about the bad back projection sometimes you're kind of like well that, that was then or whatever here i feel like you can sort of challenge some of the effects and say compared to today they they stand up there's fairly some beautiful well. miniatures like specifically atlantis it's like this big kind of tarantula that's yes. you coming out of the water really great yeah. you know and what a wicked design mm-hmm. that is yeah Oh, yeah. totally, absolutely. That that is absolutely a classic design, big time. Yeah, I they just and um, uh, with Kurt Jurgens uh, is in this Stromberg. Yeah, and uh, yes. I, I I do like I like his performance. And you know what? A lot of people don't notice is that he's got the webbed hands in this movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah, is yeah. that right? If I you, never really noticed. If you that, go yeah. to that scene where he's, uh, you know, he says uh, he, he Mr. Stromberg prefers not to shake hands. And then Roger Moore later mm-hmm. on he goes to go for the handshake and he goes like this and you can see the webbed hands and also too I think when he when he explodes oh. the helicopter near the beginning of the film and he pushes that button you can see he's got webbed hands. What do you think about his performance in general? Oh, Kurt Jurgens? Yeah, I like it. To be honest with you, I'm a little more bigger fan of Drax and Moonraker. To be honest with you, Michael Lonsdale, um, mm-hmm. I actually like him a little better. Um, but Kurt Jurgens is he's solid. I think he you know, he's always been a great actor, and um, mm. I'm not. I guess I'm not over the moon about Stromberg, but I think he he does it. He does it. He's perfectly adequate. Let's put it yeah. that way. It's funny. We're kind of, and it's funny you mentioned Drax also because we're kind right. of getting back into the Doctor No school of villainy here. Right. You know, uh, they they don't say much. Or, you know, they're very stoic and stiff. Yeah. And I kind of feel like Stromberg is almost like a combination of of Doctor No with like goldfinger and you know i've always sort of like k- kind of been critical of goldfinger because i think he's just yes. sort of a, a slouch and he's kind of sloppy yeah. and and mm. this is almost sort of a combination of the two he's got the he's got the doctor no stiffness with that kind of like slob and like he's always sort of he seems like he's always talking with his mouth full even when he's not let them get to shore 
and then kill him. <laughs> he does eat a lot in this. He does, yeah. He's <laughs> yeah, constantly yeah. sitting and eating. Not right, that I can right, get on my yeah. high horse, Riley, but yeah. it seems like every time you turn around, <laughs> right. he's got a plate of food in front of him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I guess that's part of his character, which is fine. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, again, he's not bad, but I, I he, he's sort of uh, oddly not very memorable. I think he's sort of like like if I were to make a list of like the Bond villains, he'd be like in the middle, you know. Um. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Mid, middle towards the bottom, I think, because oh, again, really? okay. I, well, I mean, and again, I if you're gonna just compare him with other Bond villains, I don't. I can't think of a lot that are necessarily bad Bond villains. Right. Uh, I can just remember the ones that would be kind of forgettable, and I sort of feel like he he's kind of almost perfectly forgettable. There, there's probably when you think about this film, you're, you're if you did a montage of this film, you're probably not going to grab a million clips of. Stromberg, you know, he's just kind of, he's, I, he's the baddie and that's fine, but that's not why we, re- we remember the film. I think there's a few scenes where he really shines though. I think when he, his first introduction, you know, um, mm. with, with those, with those two scientists and, you know, he puts uh, the girl yeah. goes into the pool and then, you know, my most profound thanks and all that stuff. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, the first meeting with Bond on Atlant- uh, Atlantis there, that's a good scene, um, between the two of them, I think. Mm. Yes, it is. Um, it is, and, then and it's kind of, of that classic sort of Bond I mean, stuff, where yeah. Bond meets the villain. That, right, right. But after that's mostly posturing. He's talking about, you know, he's talking about his plot and what he's going to do, and yeah. you know that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, you're right, but they do they do give us in this film that sort of classic James Bond versus yeah. the villain moment where yeah. we don't, you know, we I kind of know who you are, you kind of know who I am, but we're, right. we're playing it cool. So yes, yeah, no, that works pretty well. Um, and by the way, you know. The not that I'm going to pr- praise this for the action element, although the action is fantastic, but the chase scene immediately following with the uh, the Lotus, no, that I lo- whole chase, I love that. Yes, I mean that's that is <laughs> tremendous, and honestly, you know when you again kind of getting back to what I what we said about the last two films about how they were very middling, low stakes, etc. Right. Here's an example where they didn't just settle for good enough. That chase, when they get back in that car, I mean, they have first you get the motorcycle guy and that whole bit. I love that. You know, <laughs> I think all those, the all those brothers, he still couldn't fly. Missile? Oh, man. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and, you know, it, it, I kind of feel like in, in, in some of the other movies, that would have been enough. They would have yeah. just said, "Okay, we did a, a a bit here. Now we're done. Let's move on to something else." <laughs> all those but feathers, all those feathers, and he still can't fly. <laughs> there you go. But that's literally just the beginning. Then suddenly you get Jaws, and you get a whole, almost a whole separate car chase with yes. Jaws, you know, firing, and then he does the crash, which is funny, whatever. <laughs> then they oh, amp whatever. it up again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But then they amp it up again with the helicopter and Naomi's in the oh, helicopter. I'm a big so fan like, of Naomi. I, I think she's great. Um, yeah. Cal, Cal Monroe. <laughs> she was like a. She was like. A, there's actually two um, uh, girls. The Valerie Leon and uh, Cal Monroe. They were both uh, alumni of Hammer Films, the Hammer Glamour Girls, mm. and uh, they appear here because you know the British casting pool and all that stuff. But they're terrific, uh, especially Carol Monroe in this. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I almost wish, like, c- can't she be indestructible instead of Jaws? I don't know. <laughs> you know? I keep coming back in multiple films. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, w- I wouldn't yeah. complain about that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, she's, you know, it's funny. She is, I mean, she's stunning. And I remember, I, I feel like a lot of Bond fans remember her. Like, when you oh, ask, yeah. a, if you ask, like, an old school Bond fan, like, who's your favorite Bond girl? Her name comes up a lot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You well, there, there's something about like there's, there's, you know, during that chase, there's this great moment which it couldn't happen anyway. They wouldn't be able to see each other, but it's right. you know, it's like one of the cinematic things where yeah. she, you know, she kind of waves to him and he gives her a wink, and it, it's just a, it's a great moment. Yes, you know, totally. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. um, yeah. But yet again, but getting back to the the chase scene again, the fact that they like now you sort of have a third element with the helicopter, and some of the helicopter stunts are great. Oh you know, yeah, like, yeah, like, they are. Like they, like they, the helicopter goes yes. ahead to try to head them off, and then absolutely. So there they are shooting. Then the helicopter just does this total one eighty yeah. and takes off after them. Oh, it's it's wicked. I mean, yeah. You know? I mean, that's that's for real. I mean, they're doing that. Out yeah, there right. For that's real. actual <laughs> yeah. helicopter yeah. stunts. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So again, and then it ends. Then that ends with the big 
stunt where the the the, boat, the, the car goes in the water. Yeah, and then you get, then, the get some, then you get some great underwater action. Totally, <laughs> that's amazing. So I mean, honestly, this this is almost playing like all, um, all while furthering the plot a little, along a little bit too. Yeah. Right, yeah. and the, the car's underwater, and what do they do? They go and they kind of do a little investigation yeah. of the, the, the... Yeah. Holy cow. I mean, again, like, like this, you... Again, like I said, if I was complaining of, uh, about the last two, that they're low stakes, I can't make that same complaint <laughs> no, here. No, no, yeah. Because they, they, they keep going at you. This, this chase, I honestly, it sort of feels like uh, a James Cameron screenplay where, like, you know, James... I know I, you the one thing is I... Mm-hmm. Right, like one of the things I used to always admire about Cameron, uh, he did the screenplay for Rambo Two, by the way, um, Terminator Two, you know, the, the original Terminator, then Terminator Two. You would watch how things would always escalate. Yes, like you think the plot's going to end here, it goes up a step and then goes further, and then amps up a notch and goes further, etc. Like just when you think yeah. you kind of reach the the, the the natural climax, it goes up a notch. Yes. And this chase follows that suit a bit where, again, every time you think we've, we've, we've gotten rid of the baddie, we're done, we're home free, something else shows up and it goes further. And then you go all the way to the big helicopter chase. And then even that ends up with the car in the water. And that still goes on. Very so true. It, it, it is really kind of a, a you know, a pounding sort of a, like, you know, sequence there where it's yeah. not, it doesn't let up. They're not. They're not holding back, and they're not doing just enough. They're really trying to hammer it home. And and also too, yeah, we get this great underwater action sequence, which is beautifully filmed. And you know, you get that innovation of the car in in, in the water. It's great stuff. Mm. Yeah, and even throwing yeah, the wrinkle totally. about Anya stealing the plans of the car. That's kind of a neat little thing, you know. <laughs> I stole the blueprints of this car two years ago. What do you think about Stromberg's plot? Uh, this is. You know, I think this is the first time we've kind of had a plot like this, and it'll come up again later. I think it's pretty good, and I'll tell you why. Because there's no reasoning with Stromberg. I mean, with, at least with Blofeld, mm. you know, you give him like, you know, a billion dollars or whatever, and then maybe he'll go away for a little bit. But this guy, it doesn't matter. He's going to do – he's he's dead set on what he's going to do. And that makes him mm. a little more scary. You know, he's definitely – you know? <laughs> yes, that's a good point. I mean, he is full-blown. I mean, he is pretty deranged. Yeah. And yes, if you can just convince me that he believes his own BS, like, again, like, like I'm going to eliminate the whole human race and then start a, a league of people under the sea. Right. Uh, you know we can't breathe underwater, <laughs> right? It, I don't think he You cares. know, that's not really... Exactly. <laughs> he's right, got exactly. Atlantis, it, it, so he's, he's, all, he's good, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. If, if you can convince me that you believe it, then yes, then then it's then you're scary, then I believe right. that we have a threat here. So that's that that works out nicely. So yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think it maybe ups it a little bit more than, you know, Spectre just kind of playing or like in the only twice, they're kind and just playing around mm. for money um, or global, some kind of global foothold or yeah. power. And that that's fine. But, you know, yeah, I guess you gotta, you're got you doing this again. You kind of maybe have to up, try to up the stakes so, somehow. And I I think that's a good mm. solution. Yes, it is. And and I also, again, the, and they're also adding a level of of threat here. Because, again, this is this is sort of something that will, will follow Roger Moore going forward. Uh, where, like, even in films like Octopussy, for example, of you to a kill, um, they've they've recognized that the threat if you if you're threatening a lot of people, then it, the stakes dramatically go up. Yes, you know, again, and none of the Moors before this had that. Uh, we've we've even t- we've tinkered with it in like Thunderball, and I'll even throw in diamonds for this one. Um, where we've we've threatened the world and we're threatening bad things, uh, but it, here it's much more tangible. Like there, he's he's literally going to execute the yes. whole human race. And, and again, mm-hmm. I, I, I we can sort of debate whether or not does that make it a little too cartoonish. Nah, okay, that's that's a debate for another day. But the the stakes do go up. The, the stakes are higher now, and James Bond is now a full blown hero that is rescuing all of us. Yeah. We are all dependent on James yes. Bond to save the day. 
So that is a very that's a very good way to go. And again, that that now will sort of go forward and and stick with us for the most I think part. So you know, it's everything or nothing. Pardon the pun, and that's what they went in. They went into this. So I said, "Hey, man, let's just let's just go for it." We have to talk about the the tanker and the uh, that great uh, mm. sequence. On I think, in a way, it rivals "You Only Live Twice" as far as epic spectacle. And I think there's a few wrinkles that they threw in that made the scene maybe even a little better. I like the idea that you know they have the same notion of the impenetrable. Um, uh, fortress that they have to get to, or the um, the, the the main room that mm. they have to bust into. I like the idea here that they had to use that bomb, and they added a little more suspense and tension instead of oh look, the the employee is coming out the uh, alternate exit. You know, I think there's a little, this, <laughs> yeah, this is does. a little more cinematic in that you know he has to he had retrieved yes. that bomb, and then there's a great yeah. moment where he's riding that camera, and then the James Bond theme comes on. Oh, that's great stuff. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. totally. Yeah. And you know, I'll, I'll give the film a lot of credit when I was watching it. You know, honestly, uh, like as as my mind was sort of drifting, I kind of snapped back when I realized that a lot of that was there was it was they they focused on the tension of that yeah. moment, so there was like no music. Yes. For a long time, there's silence through a lot yeah. of it, so you really are kind of like breathless in anticipation for what's coming. Absolutely, you know how are they going to solve this? So yes, it, it really does sort of amp up your your sense of anxiousness. It does. I I think it's beautifully played. Yeah. Um. And 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 of course Shane Rimmer, you know, yes, he's yes, appeared yes. in quite a few. He makes a makes a probably his meatiest role, I'd say, in the Bond series. Mm. Yeah. yeah, probably. Um, and he's great, you know. Yeah, I thought he was in Moonraker, and I, I, you know, we're gonna get to that, but I don't think he's in there. I thought he was one of the astronauts, but I, I guess not, because I, I was watching it and I was like, oh, he's not in here. He's, okay. he's kind of more more of a control room guy. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, he is. I'm with he you. Is. Yeah, I feel like he's probably in there too. He's but like, th- we lost him on we lost him on the scope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like he's yeah. I feel like he's in a few of these around this era, but I'm not positive. So, but yeah, we'll get to it. Right. He's yeah, but he's ter- he's terrific. Yeah. He, yeah. He's great. Yeah. He's you know he's. I remember the last thing I saw him in that I remembered him in was Batman Begins. Yes, I yes. remember thinking like, yes, thank you for putting him in that spot <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, again, to see he's him. just yeah. manning the controls. He's just standing there, you know, speaking and talking yeah. about what's going on, giving us some plot plot exposition. Yeah. But right. boy, is he good! It was he's great. He so I was really thrilled to see him yeah. again. You know, you have Anya uh, kidnapped on the uh, Atlantis there, and he has yeah. to save her. And you know, great. You know, he goes gets on that bike. Great, great stuff. Yes, you know? totally. And which, which, and that, that that wet bike was that that was a you know kind of a big deal in 1977. Those weren't prevalent. Yes, you know, yes. And, you know, right. Till later. Exactly. Kind of going. You know, it's funny. Jet ski. We, we always laugh about uh, a view to a kill when they do the opening sequence and they do the Beach Boys because he's got oh look it's yeah. a surfboard on snow. You know, yeah. like we laugh at it now because yeah I know it's a snowboard. Why is that? You know. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. back then it was pretty that pioneering. Was the, yeah. Yeah. So and getting back to this, and, and you know, in this era, this that was a that was brand new. It was. Yeah. So yes, I mean that was pretty interesting. And by the way, too, I I I remember watching the scene where he's coming up again. You see him on the jet ski. It's it's going along, and then he kind of is approaching the 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 Atlantis base, and it's obviously just a obviously just a matte painting, but. The effect worked really well. It you know? does. I mean, it's it's yeah. again like that's why I say like the effects of this film really are pretty top notch compared to. Oh, they are. You know. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, I love like uh, like the the Atlantis rising out of the water and playing that classical music, and it's just yeah. like it's so awesome. You know. Very true. Yes, yes, yes. E- you know, even the shot in the beginning, and I'm I. I uh, when the helicopter takes off with the two scientists, and he just presses the button, and the helicopter blows up. Yeah, I feel like there was a lot more time and effort spent on that than all of the effects combined in Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> you know, I like, you might be right. I, you know, so again, I, yeah. I really I can't do have defend to hand the effects. And I can't defend the effects in Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> I'm at your mercy with that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I love you know the final confrontation with Stromberg. I think is great. It's kind of expected and very violent. I you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. It's pretty badass, man. Yeah. yeah, it's um, yeah. you know, again, it's it's interesting because, like, on one hand, I'm I'm when I watch that, the, again, the critical part of me kind of goes, 
yeah, he's going to sit him sit down and shoot him up in the crotch through the pipe because the guy never gets out of his chair. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that that really did sort of amp things up a little bit. I mean, he, he like he I takes did. a couple shots, you know, down the pipe, getting them where the sun don't shine. Right, right. And then he shoots him like point blank in the chest. Like, yeah. it's, it is a, you're absolutely right. It is sort of a step forward in violence too. I mean, it, it's it's pretty gruesome, you know. And, yeah, yeah. And even the way that Kurt Jurgens plays plays it too is 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 pretty pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty hardcore. It, it really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and then yes, then he rescues Anya, and again I like that as well because yeah, it, it it's almost like every you know they again kind of getting back to what I was saying about how every level they they take it up a notch, they they really did throw everything at this script of the kitchen sink. It's like yeah, we could blow up the the base and that's the end and we all go home. They add the level of her being on there and he has to yes. rescue her in the nick yeah. of time when everything is blowing up. And so, they had the t- they had the time clock that he's got to sh- you know yeah. he's got orders to shoot so that's good too it makes everything tight and tense you know totally yes yeah, so you yeah. Got, right all of that those elements together and then once they're in the clear she still pulls the gun on him you still yes. got that moment left where you're like oh yeah I forgot like like just when you sort of forgot about that yeah, yeah. it's just a good line you know the mission's over yeah you know? <laughs> I mean again, right again like you figure at this point like that's long, been long forgotten because right. now James Bond has rescued her or whatever right. and again it's it's kind of um, I, I would I'll even say it's kind of almost a throwaway moment because like it doesn't last very long it's, right. not, it's not a lengthy scene or anything. There's no conversation. No. It's just kind of like, you know, uh, I'm going to shoot you. Nah, not really. So, but still, the fact that it was there and and it made you sort of like second yeah. guess for a second. I go, oh, I've, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I also have to just back up just a little bit here uh, and talk about the, the final confrontation with Jaws, too, because, I, I you know, I love the whole thing with the big magnet and all that. That seems to work. It's one of the goofier things that I like, you know? Yeah. And the way the way Moore smiles, and then he smiles, and then he looks up. It is good stuff. But <laughs> I always thought it would be great. I always thought I like the irony of like Jaws being eaten by the shark. It just seems very like a, like a poetic justice or something. Um, I, but I do. The, there's also the argument that he said, "Well, you know, man eats shark," kind of thing, um, which is kind of cool as well. But yeah, uh, in hindsight, maybe it would have been better if they had just been dispatched by the shark. Yeah, you, know, you have your bit of irony, and then you can move on. He doesn't have to be in Moonraker with the um, the action scenes. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I don't listen. I, you know, it's funny because seriously, you would think that, especially later, especially in Moonraker with Bond and Jaws again, the whole parallel of of uh, the Coyote and the Roadrunner. Like you would think, I, I would normally wholeheartedly agree and say, "Yeah, just kill him off, please. Be done with it." But <laughs> I, I don't mind when the 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 the, the baddie like that kind of gets away. Baron Samity kind of has like a little oh, wink yeah, at the yeah, end, yeah. like he's not officially taken out. And then Jaws, right. you do that. And honestly, again, not that I can say a lot of good things about Spectre, but I did like the the character of uh, Mister Hinks and the fact that he, again, he he. Does he die? Does he not die? It, it's left to, we don't know. Right. So I thought he could have been brought back. I don't think he's going to, but so I don't mind that. I don't mind that exactly. You know, I, I don't mind it on its own. Like again, yeah. the way they took it was a little silly, but yeah. the fact that he gets away. Just a little. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, yeah, but that, but that, but that's another video. But yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, but the whole concept of him escaping doesn't bother me necessarily. No, it's kind of a cool. Yeah, yeah. I guess you go with the whole Manny truck. I just like I kind of like the irony of you know mm. it is what it is. But yeah, we got uh, oh yeah we got uh, Bernard Lee and Q um, and we got the General Gogo. Is this the first? I think yes. it's the first. Pa- it's the first appearance of General Gogo. Uh, yes, is that I think right? it is. Yeah. Is that character? Not the actor. He's been in From Russia With Love, but yeah. Right, yes, yes. No, I think that the Gogol character is the first time we see him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is that is worth talking about, by the way. Because, yeah, he's, he becomes a, a very reoccurring character yes, for a long yes, time. Yes, yes, um, By the way, it's also, this is kind of a side note, it's the first time you ever hear M uh, mentioned by his first name, Miles. After you, Alexis. Oh, no, no, after you, Miles. Uh, thank you. Which okay. ties him in with the Miles Masterpiece of the books. So I like that. 
Uh, yeah, that and that whole thing is actually pretty cool. And uh, the the whole Bond kind of getting tied in with the Russians again, very interesting. And and again, the the movies have not been very political up until this point, especially not in the Roger Moore years. Um, and they're not really getting political here either. But we are addressing the Cold War finally. So yes, I, I do find that the the General Gogol stuff and M pretty interesting stuff. There's a great moment where he comes in from the pyramids and then Gogol sitting there, and they have that music yes. cue, and then they do the whole thing around. He goes around the beam and everything. Really, that's a that's a great moment. Uh, yes, yeah, it really yeah, is. Yes, yeah. the Very only thing well I'd shot. say they're going through later on. They're going through Q's lab, and they're like they're going to show them all the secret stuff. But it's a, it's all fun, and it's a, just a movie, <laughs> so whatever. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, Q's lab has to get transported out to Egypt just to have a walkthrough scene. But whatever, we're good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they do that in all these movies now, right? But but yeah, totally. They, yeah. There's a Q's lab wherever he goes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Big time. But it's great, you know, always walk. Q's always walk. Oh, yeah. Q gives him the Lotus. I mean, what a great car. Yeah. Yes. And by the way, I mentioned that they mentioned um, M's first name in this film. Uh, it's interesting that she calls him Major Boothroyd. Good morning, Major Boothroyd. Good morning, Major. Yes. Again, she's like, good morning, his... Major Boothroyd. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, so, so, again, I, you know, I said earlier and I almost kind of glanced past it, but there's so many times in this film where again they're sort of embracing the fact that this is a James Bond movie and again we're, we we get back to the vodka martinis and all of the the the, the, the fact that Bond had a wife uh, and even things like mentioning their names which was really up until this point was only mentioned in the books um, or maybe in passing like Boothroyd you see him in the credits of from Russia with love you don't really see it you don't, it's not really spoken uh, so yeah, they really are getting back to the, the essence of the character of James Bond. So yeah. And, and you see it in little hints throughout the whole thing. And I think it's great. I have to say, I, I, I got lucky here cause, uh, and here in Atlanta, they did a, um, the Plaza theater played all the James Bond films. I found out about it, um, kind of late in the game, but I was like, Ooh, I can catch the spy who loved me. And I decided to do that. Um, and I went down. And they, um, I got, they had this, I got this popcorn. It was like this, it was just the perfect size. And it, it was like perfectly buttered and salted. And they said, oh, you get a free re- free refill on that. I said, oh, this is great. So movie starts and I'm eating my popcorn. I'm like, this is so delicious. I'm like, I'm definitely, this tastes like more. I'm definitely going to get some. And I'm trying to go through my head. I'm thinking, what's a good scene to go get the popcorn? And I couldn't come up with one. I was like, there's no good scene to, to leave and come back. Um, so I sat there, I did not get another popcorn. So I sat there and watched the whole movie, but, uh, and I kind of didn't know where I was going to score. So I was like, I know it's like a nine, but is it a 10? And I started to think about it, thinking about it. And, um, I'm like, you know what? It's a 10. I'm going to give it a 10. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for the, go for the moon here. And maybe a, uh, maybe I'm cheating a little here. Maybe a soft ten. It's not like the hard ten of from Russia with Love, but it's a ten nonetheless. I think it's an important film in the uh, filmography of the Bond films. It's one great scene after another. It's one of those movies maybe people take for granted uh, nowadays. But if you sit down and watch it, there's one great scene after another here, and uh, it moves. Um, and it's got great action um, and great stuff, and I love it. So there you go. There's nothing like Scott to score a movie to make me look like a total curmudgeon, but uh, <laughs> you know, I know I've been high here. It's like he's like this guy's like Susan Granger. He loves everything, you know. <laughs> uh, and I and I can't argue with anything you're saying. I mean, it is a great film. Um, I so basically when I score it. You know, again, the man with the golden gun was a five. I said it was just, just, just total medium. Live and let die is a little bit better with a six. Uh, I think this one is a seven, and and I and again, it sounds critical, but again, it's it's really just shy of when I really start to get into my classic bonds that I just just absolutely adore. Uh, but yeah, it is it is a great film, and again, it's still it's still a little cartoony for my taste, but I don't mind that in this this case. Uh, it, it, it does a great job of saying this is James Bond. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're going to get back to James Bond and what makes James Bond unique. 
Uh, it's a lot of fun. They really do, like I said, they throw everything at you but the kitchen sink. There, there's no sense of, well, that's good enough. No, they really do take it up a notch at every turn. The pre-title is back and it's spectacular. The chase scenes, again, every time you think that we've had enough, they take it up a notch. Um, and whenever the, you think the movie's almost over, there's an added level of rescuing Enya, and then we still have the tension between the two of them. So they real they really do just they 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 don't shy away from you know going for it. This is they, they're absolutely swinging for the fences, and I think they succeed. Uh, so the seven again, yes, it's it is a uh, probably a little more dismissive than it should be, but again, I got my. My greats that I, I I give my eights and nines to, but uh, yeah, I, it's it's a great film. I love it, and it's it's a high. I'll call it a high seven, and and leave it at that. I would say some of the Jaws buffoonery. Um, I like the character of Jaws, and like in the first part of it, he's very you know he's a force to be reckoned with, and uh, there's no nonsense. And then um, he drops a stone on his foot, and it gets a little goofy. It's not it's not as bad as it gets in Moonraker, but. Um, I wish Jaws would be taken just a little bit more seriously. I don't have a whole lot to point at with this one. I will say that there's one effect after I kind of raved about how the effects got so much better. When when they kidnap Annie and they take off in the speedboat, there's one shot where they take off and you're like looking at like it looks it looks like a toy with two dolls in it. Like it's is a little clunky. Um, in terms of just something I would have changed to make it better, or at least I think would have made it better. When he's having the conversation uh, about, and you're still on the boat, I have to get her. And when he goes, how? They start to have a conversation about, oh, where's the thing I brought? Let's uh, bring that in here. And they start to unpack it. Honestly, I would have just cut it right when he says how and just cut right to the boat, him on the... He has Anya on there. I know, James. I'm sorry. I have to get her off. How? Yeah, not a big deal, but honestly, I kind of felt like there's a linger there that that you you could have you you would have had a much bigger impact if you just I got to get her off. How cut to him speeding over there on the thing, and that would have I think that would have worked. Should I steal the ski jump from you? <laughs> Go for it. All right. Um, yeah, that um, that ski jump is amazing. It, it's 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 wildly terrific, and uh, it really. I think it's like it's it's one of those things that laid down a gauntlet for the whole film, and uh, thankfully the film lives up to the rest of that too, because um, we'll see like in Moonraker where maybe not so much. So I will say, and again, I I, I kind of feel like the one thing I probably forgot to mention was that there's a lot of really great supporting characters that, as opposed to something like Diamonds, where I feel like where do they find these guys? Uh, a lot of the supporting cast in this, like Max Caliber is very good, you know? Um, so everybody involved with this is really good. Uh, and again, the whole film is pretty great, but if I have to pick one thing, and I feel like I kind of already sort of beat this to death, but I really like that chase with the Lotus, and specifically, again, because they keep taking it up a notch. There's no, that, that's really where you can watch this film and realize that there was no one saying, okay, that's good enough. It, 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 it seems like they were always saying, what else can we do? How, how can we bring this up to the next level? And they keep doing that. So, yeah, that that Lotus chase scene. And again, like as a kid of the 70s, early 80s, like I can recall people talking about the Lotus, how cool it was. Now we're all DB5, 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 DB5. But honestly, that Lotus was really cool. And that this scene is why that that car became so iconic at that at that that time. All right, then that's uh, the spy who loved me, and and again, what number are we up to already? The, this is Bond, this is the, the tenth Bond film, and the in oh, the wow. uh, yeah. We, so we're kind of ha- that's you know we're kind of not halfway there, but we're we're closing in on it. Mm-hmm. Isn't yeah. that crazy? How I can't believe we're at mm. ten. That, that means the halfway point is not far away. So these <laughs> these reviews are going pretty oh, fast. Yeah. And I'm loving doing them, and oh, I hope God. everybody's enjoying watching them as much as as much fun yeah. as we're having doing them. Totally, totally. My friend, thank you, thank as you always, very much. For, for being always here. Always a pleasure. It's it, always It gives us a chance to Absolutely. talk about movies that we love, and we're just enjoying the hell, all the oh, hell of it, awesome. you know? 
This is Being James Bond Reviews, the countdown. Oh, actually, I could I could start saying the countdown to to uh, <laughs> no, no, no time to die. <laughs> no time to die. <laughs> what is it? Another another no way to time. die. Die another day. I'm gonna I'm gonna be doing this for weeks. So the countdown to no time to die continues. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Oh, that's funny. Good.